Wuthering Heights, Chapter 9. He entered, vociferating oaths dreadful to hear, and caught me in the act of stowing his son away in the kitchen cupboard. Hareton was impressed with the wholesome terror of encountering either his wild beast's fondness or his madman's rage, for in one he ran a chance of being squeezed and kissed to death, and in the other of being flung into the fire or dashed against the wall, and the poor thing remained perfectly quiet wherever I chose to put him. "'There, I've found it out at last,' cried Hindley, pulling me back by the skin of my neck like a dog." By heaven and hell, you've sworn between you to murder that child. I know how it now, how it is now, that he is always out of my way. But with the help of Satan, I shall make you swallow the carving knife, Nelly. You needn't laugh, for I've just crammed Kenneth head downmost into the black horse marsh. And two is the same as one, and I want to kill some of you. I shall have no rest till I do. But I don't like the carving knife, Mr. Hindley, I answered. It has been cutting red herrings. I'd rather be shot, if you please. You'd rather be damned, he said, and you, and so you shall. No law in England can hinder a man from keeping his house decent, and mine's abominable. Open your mouth. He held the knife in his hand and pushed its point between my teeth. But for my part, I was never much afraid of his vagaries. I spat out and affirmed it tasted detestably. I would not take it on any account. Oh, said he, releasing me, I see that hideous little villain is not Hareton. I beg your pardon now. If it be, he deserves flaying alive for not running to welcome me and for screaming as if I were a goblin. Unnatural cub, come hither. I'll teach thee to impose on a good-hearted, deluded father. Now... Don't you think the lad would be handsome or cropped? It makes a dog fiercer, and I love something fierce. Get me the scissors, something fierce and trim. Besides, it's infernal affection, devilish conceit it is, to cherish our ears. We're asses enough without them. Hush, child, hush. Well, then, it is my darling. Wished dry thy eyes. There's a joy. Kiss me. What? It won't? Kiss me, Hareton. Damn thee, kiss me. Thy God, as if I would rear such a monster, as sure as I'm living, I'll break that brat's neck. Poor Hareton was squalling and kicking in his father's arms with all his might and redoubled his yells when he carried him upstairs and lifted him over the banister. I cried out that he would frighten the child into fits and ran to rescue him. As I reached them, Hindley leaned forward on the rails to listen to a noise below, almost forgetting what he had in his hands. Who is that? he asked, hearing someone approaching the stairs foot. I leaned forward also for the purpose of signing to Heathcliff, whose step I recognized not to come further. <laughs> and at the instant when my eye quitted Hareton, he gave such a sudden spring, delivered himself from the careless grasp that held him, and fell. There was scarcely time to experience a thrill of horror before we saw that the little wretch was safe. Heathcliff arrived underneath just at the critical moment. By a natural impulse, he arrested his descent, and setting him on his feet, looked up to discover the author of the accident, a miser who has parted with a lucky lottery ticket for five shillings and finds next day he has lost in the bargain five thousand pounds, could not slow a blanker countenance than he did on beholding the figure of Mr. Earnshaw above. It expressed plainer than words could do the intense anguish at having made himself the instrument of thwarting his own revenge. Had it been dark, I dare say, he would have tried to remedy the mistake by smashing Hareton's skull on the steps. But we witnessed his salvation, and I was presently below with my precious charge pressed to my heart. Hindley descended more leisurely, sobered and abashed. It is your fault, Ellen, he said. You should have kept him out of sight. You should have taken him from me. Is he injured anywhere? Injured, I cried angrily. If he's not killed... He'll be an idiot. Oh, I wonder his mother does not rise from her grave to see you use him. You're worse than a heathen, treating your own flesh and blood in that manner. He attempted to touch the child, who, on finding himself with me, sobbed off his terror directly. 
At the first finger his father laid on him, however, he shrieked again louder than before and struggled as if he would go into convulsions. You shall not meddle with him, I continued. He hates you. They all hate you. That's the truth. A happy family you have and a pretty state you've come to. I shall come to a prettier yet, Nellie, laughed the misguided man, recovering his hardness. At present, convey, convey yourself and him away. And hark you, Heathcliff, clear you too, quite from my reach and hearing. I wouldn't murder you tonight, unless perhaps I set the house on fire. But that's as my fancy goes. While saying this, he took a pint bottle of brandy from the dresser and poured some into a tumbler. Nay, don't, I entreated. Mr. Hindley, do take warning. Have mercy on this unfortunate boy if you care nothing for yourself. Any one will do better for him than I shall, he answered. Have mercy on your own soul, I said, endeavoring to snatch the glass from his hand. Not I. On the contrary, I shall have great pleasure in sending it to perdition to punish its maker, exclaimed the blasphemer. Here, here's to its hearty damnation. He drank the spirits and impatiently bade us go, terminating his command with a sequel of horrid imprecations, too bad to repeat or remember. It's a pity he cannot kill himself with drink, observed Heathcliff, muttering an echo of curses back when the door was shut. He's doing his very utmost, but his constitution defies him. Mr. Kenneth says he would wager his mare that he'll outlive any man on this side Gimmerton, or go to and go to the grave a hoary sinner unless some happy chance out of the common course befall him. I went into the kitchen and sat down to lull my little lamb to sleep. Heathcliff, as I thought, walked through to the barn. He t it turned out afterwards that he only got as far as the other side of the settle, when he flung himself on a bench by the wall, removed from the fire, and remained silent. I was rocking Hareton on my knee and humming a song that began. It was far in the night, and the baron, the baronese grat, the mither beat, Neath the mules heard that. When Kathy, Miss Kathy, who had listened to the hubbub from her room, put her head in and whispered, Are you alone, Nellie? Yes, miss, I replied. She entered and approached the hearth. I, supposing she was going to say something, looked up. The expression of her face seemed disturbed and anxious. Her lips were half asunder as if she meant to speak, and she drew a breath but it escaped in a sigh instead of a sentence. I resumed my song, not having forgotten her recent behavior. Where's Heathcliff? She said, interrupting me. About his work in the stable, was my answer. He did not contradict me. Perhaps he had fallen into a doze. There, following, there followed another long pause during which I perceived a drop or two trickle from Catherine's cheek to the flags. Is she sorry for his shameful conduct? I asked myself, that will be a novelty. If she may come to a point as she will, I shan't help her. No, she felt small tremble. She felt small trouble regarding any subject save her own concerns. Oh dear, she cried at last, I'm very unhappy. A pity, observed I. You're hard to please. So many friends and so few cares and can't make yourself content. Nellie, will you keep a secret for me, she pursued, kneeling down by me and lifting her winsome eyes to my face with that sort of look which turns off bad temper, even when one has all the right in the world to indulge it. Is it worth keeping? I inquired less sculkily. Yes, and it worries me, and I must let it out. I want to know what I should do. Today, Edgar Linton asked me to marry him, and I've given him an answer. Now, before I tell you whether it was a consent or denial, you tell me which which it ought to have been. Really, Miss Catherine, how can I know? I replied. To be sure, considering the exhibition you performed in his presence this afternoon, I might say it would be wise to refuse him. Since he asked you after that, he must either be hopelessly stupid or a venturesome fool. If you talk so, I won't tell you any more, she returned peevishly, rising to her feet. I accepted him, Nellie. Be quick and say whether I was wrong. You accepted him. That, what, 
Then what good is it discussing the matter? You have pledged your word and cannot retract. But say whether I should have done so. Do, she exclaimed in an irritated tone, chafing her hands together and frowning. There are many things to be considered before that question can be answered properly, I said sen senten sententiously. First and foremost, do you love Mr. Edgar? Who can help it? Of course I do, she answered. Then I put her through the following catechism. For a girl of 22, it was not in injudicious. Why do you love him, Miss Cathy? Nonsense, I do. That's sufficient. By no means. You must say why. Well, because he is handsome and pleasant to be with. Bad was my commentary. And because he is young and cheerful. Bad still. And because he loves me. Indifferent, coming there. And he will be rich. And I shall be like to, to be the, the greatest woman of the neighborhood. And, and I shall be proud of having such a husband. Worst of all. And now, say how you love him. As everybody loves. You're silly, Nellie. Not at all. Answer. I love the ground under his feet and the air over his head and everything he touches and every word he says. I love all his looks and all his actions and him entirely and altogether. There now. And why? Nay, you are making a jest of it. It is exceedingly ill-natured. It's no jest to me, said the young lady, scowling and turning her face to the fire. I'm very far from jesting, Miss Catherine, I replied. You love Mr. Edgar because he is handsome and young and cheerful and rich and loves you. The last, however, goes for nothing. You would love him without that, probably, and with it you wouldn't unless he possessed the four former attractions. No, to be sure not. I should only pity him, hate him, perhaps, if he were ugly and a clown. But there are several other handsome, rich young men in this world, handsomer possibly, and richer than he is. What should hinder you from loving them? If there be any, they are out of my way. I've seen none like Edgar. You may see some, and he won't be, he won't always be handsome and young, and may not always be rich. He is now, and I have only to do with the present. I wish you would speak rationally. Well, that settles it. If you have only to do with the present, marry Mr. Linton. I don't want your permission for that. I shall marry him, and yet you have not told me whether I'm right. Perfectly right, if people be right to marry only for the present. And now, let us hear what you are unhappy about. Your brother will be pleased. The old lady and gentleman will not object, I think. You will escape from a disorderly, comfortless home into a wealthy, respectable one. And you love Edgar, and Edgar loves you. All seems smooth and easy. Where is the obstacle? Here, and here, replied Catherine, striking one hand on her forehead and the other on her breast. In whichever place the soul lives, in my soul and in my heart, I'm convinced I'm wrong. That's very strange. I cannot make it out. It's my secret, but if you will not mock at me, I'll explain it. I can't do it distinctly, but I'll, I'll give you a feeling of how I feel. She seated herself by me again. Her countenance grew sadder and graver, and her clasped hands trembled. Nellie, do you never dream queer dreams, she said. Suddenly, after some minutes' reflection, yes, now and then, I answered, and so do I. I've dreamt in my life dreams that have stayed with me ever after and changed my ideas.